All right, Psalm 74, let's dig right into this passage. Look down there at verse number one where the Bible reads, O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? And, uh, you know, again, this, this questioning, we, we've seen this in some of the Psalms in the past where um, God's people are being, you know, persecuted and it feels like God has just cast you off forever. Like, why Like, like why have you just been absent for so long? Have you just cast us off completely? And, and does your anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Of course, these are just references to the children of God, the people of God. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. And I love these references to his people being redeemed, being purchased, being saved, that we're, hey, look, we're your people. And this is, remember, in the Old Testament. This is a, this is a psalm in the Old Testament time, way before the birth and the, and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior, right? So uh, these people were redeemed even back in the Old Testament. And this is all language that's used in Scripture for people who are saved. And, and you, think, you might think, like, how can this be? Well, first of all, there, you know, there's, there's lots of symbolism of God saving, and there's physical occurrences of God saving. So you can go back to with Moses and God saving the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. When they were in slavery, he set them free. They led them, he led them uh, through the Red Sea and, and brought them ultimately into the promised land physically. So God became their God, and, and they were his people, and he um, saved them in one sense, absolutely. He was able to bring that congregation through the wilderness of sin, even ultimately into the promised land. But obviously, even more important than that is just the fact that God's people, that congregation, are purchased. Not just um, in the sense of like when, the, the, when the, the death angel passed over in Egypt and passed over the houses, right, that had the blood on the doorposts. Of course, that physically happened. But way more important than that is the spiritual application of the blood being applied to the door of your heart and uh, the salvation that comes with the blood that is applied to you, the blood of Jesus Christ, of course, the Lamb. As the Bible says in Revelation 13, 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life, the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So the lamb, it's the, you know, this is a reference to the book of life, but it's the book of life of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the, of the world. So the fact that Christ came and died on the cross, in God's eyes, it was already done since the foundation of the world. It was already planned. It was already going to happen. It was already sure and set and sealed. And it, it, it was just as certain of happening before it happened as it is after it happened. Right. Obviously, right now we can look back and know, yeah, Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again from the dead. Well, that event was so secure that it, it, it was from the foundation of the world, which is also why these people can be referred to as being redeemed, as being purchased. Because ultimately, how were they purchased? They were purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's great seeing this Old Testament reference to that. And, and also, as we dig into this psalm, you're going to notice, um, I, I believe this psalm is very prophetic of, of multiple events that come, as, as many of the Old Testament prophecies are. But, and we'll dig into that in just a minute, but just kind of keep that in mind as it's already talking about his redeemed and his people and his congregation and the people kind of wondering, like, where, where are you, God? What, what's going on, right? They're in a condition, they're in a state where it seems like God's not around, but there's a lot of wicked people around. Verse number three, lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. 
So now it's bringing up desolations. I mean, well, what, what, is, what does it mean to be desolate? I mean, it's, I think it's pretty obvious, right? We still know this word desolate. It's pretty empty, right? Uh, so, so you think of the, one of the things that comes to my mind is the abomination of desolation. That uh, makes empty the, where, where it's set up, but it's, it's going to be empty of the people of God, the things of God. It's, it's making that place desolate, desolate of the truth, desolate of holiness, desolate of anything that's good. And there's these perpetual desolations being described here. And it says, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. We're talking about the enemies doing wickedly. Now, at the time of this writing, of course, this isn't happening. The enemies aren't actively, you know, coming into the, the temple, which hadn't even been built, at least in David's day. You know, I don't know. This is a psalm of Asaph, but... Asaph lived during the time of David, right? So yeah, how old? I don't know exactly, but this wasn't happening. Obviously, this is prophetic of the future when he's referring to uh, the enemy doing wickedly in the sanctuary. Verse 4 says, Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees, but now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. So what's this referring to? This is just imagery talking about the destruction of the temple, the destruction of God's sanctuary, the destruction of God's holy place where there's an army or a force coming in. They've got their ensigns. They've got their banners. They're coming in with destruction but it's, it's not in the name of the Lord. It's not anything like that. So the, the first um, foreshadowing or prophecy that I could see this happening is in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, just as Jesus prophesied that it would be when one stone was not left upon another and the Roman soldiers came in. Hey, they had their ensigns, right? They came in and destroyed and totally uh, um devastated and it says here that you know man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon uh the tree the thick trees so you remember when solomon was in building of the temple they've got the great uh trees from the cedars of lebanon and they they he you know he got all the best of the best and the best trees and the best foundation all this great work was done to put into the house of the lord and and people made the um you know, worked with the wood even and engraved all kinds of different things and the palm trees and the pomegranates and everything else that, that is in the temple of the Lord. Um, all that beautiful work. It says a man was, made, was famous for doing that great work and now they're just coming in and breaking it down and destroying it and burning it and cutting it up, right? Like that's, that's what's being described here. So again, at, like before the temple is even built or just at the very beginning of it, it's already prophesying in this psalm this great destruction. And then, of course, there's going to be an, a desolation at the very end of things as well. Keep your place here in Psalm 74. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 25. We're going to see some similar wordings in a prophecy because this type of this prophecy is found throughout much of Scripture. You'll find in the book of Isaiah, you find in Jeremiah, Jeremiah right before they went captive into Babylon, of course, is a, another destruction. Right? You've got the, the first temple being destroyed before the second temple is built. And then that second temple being destroyed in 70 AD. And then, of course, we believe that there's going to be a third temple that's built where the, the Antichrist is going to be setting up the abomination of desolation. And ultimately, that'll be destroyed, too. So um, these desolations that have been prophesied have... I believe, multiple applications to future events. And, of course, everything was future events at the time of the writing of Psalm 74. Now we have some of those things in the past. But um, let's keep reading. And, and there's even things that are written in Psalm 74 that, to my knowledge, didn't occur yet either. So I think it's appropriate to still be able to apply 
some of Psalm 74 at least to future events as well and not just things that have happened in the past, which is also the case in many other things. You look at even in the book of Daniel, you look at the prophecies in the book of Daniel, some of those things have already been fulfilled and have already come to pass, but not everything. And even when you start to look at all the prophecies and try to apply it to things that have already happened, it didn't all come to pass, which is how we know that, no, these things still bear uh, uh, credence. We, we still should be looking at these things for future events because they did not all happen the way the Bible said. And here's the thing. When it comes to the word of God, everything comes to pass. Amen. Nothing falls short of God's word. And I mean, we believe it's God's word. It's not just the word of man. It's not, oh, those are, those are just some things that the man is just trying their best to, to write down these visions or, um, you know, maybe something was missed or something was added. No, not with the word of God. God is the one who's preserved his word. So we have full, full, full faith in that. And when God speaks, it happens, Amen. right? God's word never returns void. And, it, and historically, you can read the things that were fulfilled. It all comes to pass every single time to a T. I mean, think about the biggest example is Jesus Christ. It's like, I mean, he made sure that every single prophecy concerning him was done before he was even able to die up on the cross. Like when he said, it is finished, it was, it was every prophecy that need everything that was written of him every work that he needed to do on this earth had to be complete before he could give up the ghost Amen. and that's what happened which is why the bible says and this sermon isn't really about this but uh it literally references you know when he had taken of the when when they put the hyssop up and he, and he took his vinegar then like that's when it was done he had he had to receive that last little bit to, to fulfill that last prophecy while he's alive. Obviously, there are still more prophecies that were continuing to be fulfilled after his death, right? Including his resurrection, but even when they didn't break a bone of his body and, and they pierced his side, right? Those things happened after he died. But up until that point, when he finally received that vigor, he said, okay, it is finished. Because every little piece, everything that had to happen then finally happened for him to do that. So, um, you know, so many examples in Scripture where God's word is given, and then it comes to pass exactly the way it was. One of my favorite ones outside of Jesus is, is when Josiah's name is mentioned way, way, way early on in, the, in Israel as a kingdom, like, like going way back to the splitting of uh, Israel and Judah is when the man of God prophesied Josiah by name that was going to come and destroy that altar that uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, set up and burn the bones of the prophets on it. And that was some 400 years before it actually came to pass. And then we see that actually literally happening to a T exactly way. So those types of things are in, in the scripture all throughout. So when we see prophecy and it's clear or it's evident to us that things have not all been fulfilled, right? Like a part of scripture that's talking about the sun and moon being darkened and the third of the stars falling, you know, it's like, yeah, that hasn't happened yet. Like that, that's a pretty big event. We know, we know that that hasn't happened yet. And there's other things you can say where there's, you know, great tribulation that's never been before, never will be again. And it's kind of like, was that fulfilled in 70 AD? Cause I don't think so. I mean, yeah, it was a great tribulation for the people or for the Jews that were there at that time in Jerusalem, but not a worldwide event, not something that uh, where, where there's many other descriptions given in the book of Daniel and elsewhere. So um, anyhow, we'll see some of the same thing here, and I'll point it out as we get to it in Psalm 74. But I had you turn to Jeremiah chapter 25, verse number 7. The Bible reads, Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them. And make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. 
And we had the, the reference to perpetual desolations in Psalm 74. Now, like I said, this is for, you know, regarding, I would say, the destruction of the first temple when they were taken captive into Babylon. And why did that happen? Is because the children of Israel in their hearts turned away from the Lord. And then it gets to a point where the people are probably thinking, well, where are you, God? Where have you been? Just like Psalm 74 starts out. Well, it's because you turn your back on God and you start worshiping other gods. And then it's like, oh, yeah, well, where is he now? Well, yeah, he's leaving you to your own devices because you rejected him. And, and that's oftentimes where things go. But then you might have one or two men of God just going like, hey, you know, don't cast us off forever. Like, remember your congregation. Remember that promise. Remember, remember that we're still here. Remember you're redeemed. And there's always mercy shown at least for the remnant and, and, and for those who are the children of God. Verse 10 there says, Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. Now, this is one reference. This is the reference, like I said, to the first temple and Babylon. Of course, Babylon has other symbolic um, prophecies moving forward into and times events that we haven't even reached yet as well. And there's a lot of similarities there. So, but I just wanted to point out this one thing when he's talking about the desolations. Well, this happens when the children of Israel are taken captive and brought into Babylon and their land is made desolate, right? And then um, go back to Psalm 74, if you would. Continuing on about the destruction of the sanctuary, verse 7 says, They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, Let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. Now, this is one that I'm not certain of as far as historically of all the synagogues of God being burned up in the land, right? Like where, where every meeting place where people would worship. I know in 70 AD they, they focused on, they attacked Jerusalem. That was the, the Jewish war or the Jewish Roman war. And they specifically targeted Jerusalem and the temple, but I couldn't speak to, I was trying to briefly to, to see if there was evidence that like every Every synagogue is just being destroyed, and I didn't see evidence for that, and I haven't seen evidence for that anywhere in history, but like I said, I'm not an expert on this matter specifically on, on, on all the synagogues being burned up, but it wouldn't surprise me with my knowledge of what's going to happen when Antichrist comes into power, and look, I know we don't worship in synagogues, but this is what the people of God were worshiping in, right? but to apply this to churches in the future when the Antichrist is literally making war with the saints to just destroying all of the churches, all of the worship places, everything where anyone is meeting to serve God. That wouldn't surprise me since that is on a global scale already anyways, since he forms a one world government and a one world religion and, and is trying to wipe out and eradicate all of the saints of God. These other events that happened throughout history did not have that scope of going to try to annihilate all of the people of God from underneath the whole heaven, right? They're all localized in one place. So all of the synagogues of the land being destroyed, I think, speaks to still a future event to come. Now, I'm open to hearing if, there, if there's evidence that speaks of like, no, they really did all this. Hey, that's all that would do is just show that it also prophesied <laughs> an earlier event as well. It's not, I mean, that's all you're doing is still proving God's word, right? That applied earlier as well as later. I think this can easily apply 
uh, both, just like many of the, of the prophecies do apply more than one time, right? Uh, let's keep reading here, verse number nine. We see not our signs, there is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. And what a sad condition to be in when there's no more any prophet. We don't have a preacher. We don't have anyone preaching to us the word of God. We have nobody that can speak to us in the name of the Lord. We've got nothing. And that's the condition that the people were in at this time where they're going, we don't even know. We don't know how long. Now, obviously with the, with the first, uh, destruction of the temple, you had prophets like Jeremiah who was saying literally from the Lord how long it was going to be. And then near the end of the captivity, you had Daniel studying that out, the, the book of Jeremiah, and going, oh yeah, it's 70 years are almost up, right? And then you have the prophecy of Jesus Christ warning of that second temple being destroyed. And but maybe not as much, well, I guess there was, there was a timeline for that as well, um, given in, you know, even if you applied any of the book of Revelation, when you look at seven years, there was a seven years war where um, those events took place where the, the destruction of the temple was kind of in the middle of that war. And then, um, but at that point, I would say there, I mean, who knows if there was any, uh, it didn't seem to be much profit activity, uh, I think, because it was more the the war was more against the Jews, like the Pharisees and the the political Jews, than it was about the the people of God, right? Like the Israel of God during that time. But a a, a nation, a people that's going to turn their heart from the Lord and not want to have anything to do with them. Well, yeah, it's no surprise then when they're going like, yeah, there's no prophet, there's no one to speak the word of God. Just like when uh, Elijah thought that he was the only one, right? The heart of the people, they're all going after Baal. There's all this, the popular thing was to worship Baal. And that's what was being promoted by Ahab and Jezebel. And Elijah's just like, I'm the only one left. And God's like, no, there's 7,000. But when a people at large are kind of turning their heart from the Lord, it gets harder and harder to find good preaching. Amen. I mean, that, that seems to be the way things have been going these days. I mean, there's a, reason, there's a reason why this church has people visiting from, like, all over the place, or churches like ours. And it's not because I just have the most awesome preaching in the world, okay? I know that it's not that great, but I am preaching the Word of God. And there is a dearth of people who will preach the Word of God, right? So, in this, like, like, this church of all places is definitely not a cult of personality, Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm aware enough to know that it is definitely nothing special about me personally. There's definitely other preachers out there that have much better, more dynamic, more exciting, more thrilling personalities than I do. But the reason why people are coming from all over the place for these various churches, it's because they're preaching the word of God and because there's hardly any churches that are doing that. I mean, I'm hearing this all the time from literally everybody that comes to our church. Yeah, there's just no churches that are doing it. Like I've gone to this church and this church, and I hear all the stories of all the churches I've been visiting, and it's just like they're not teaching the Word of God. Amen. They, just, they do a few verses, they'll speak for a little while, and that's it. And that's what happens when you have a, a country or a nation in the condition like it's in today. There's no more any prophet. Where are they all? There's no one that knows how long. How long is this going to go on? Well, in order to, to have any wisdom on that, you're going to need to be in your scripture. You're going to need to be in the Bible to even know these things. Amen. People who didn't know how long, well, you know what? Daniel knew how long. We know what? Daniel was in the word of God. Daniel was living a sold out life. Daniel cared about the things of God. Amen. And Daniel would preach the truth regardless of the consequences. So yeah, Daniel knew how long. But where are all the Daniels today? Where are the people studying and loving the Word of God and, and, and giving their lives for the Word of God and preaching the Word of God, the whole counsel of God? There's not much of it left, unfortunately, anymore. And this is what happens before destruction. Look at verse number 10. O God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? 
And we just see more increase in our day of the enemy blaspheming the name of God more and more. It's just happening uh, in, in increased numbers. It seems like every year it just gets worse and worse. Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. So this is an entreaty to the Lord, like, God, I know you're powerful. Why are you withholding your hand? Why don't you bring judgment? Look, these people are blaspheming you. These people are wicked. Look at what they're doing to your sanctuary. Look at what they're doing to your people. Look at what's going on, God. You know, arise and defend us. God, bring your mighty hand forward and bring judgment. This is what's being requested. Verse 12, for God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. So he's going into just these illustrations of God's great strength. God, we know you're strong enough. I mean, you can do anything. Look at the things that you've done of old. And he's talking about you know, dividing the sea. God, your strength did that. You can part the sea so that people can walk on dry land. And then he brings up, and, but this is really interesting because there's a twofold purpose for this. The surface application and understanding of this is just the illustration of God's strength. Like, hey, you're, he was able to just destroy Leviathan or these dragons, right? He's a, and, and a dragon was a real beast. Okay, I believe it's a real created being that existed in this earth. I, I don't know if there's any still lurking in the depths of the seas today. Doesn't matter whether they are or not. They did for sure, at least at some point. When it's talking about here the heads of Leviathan being broken in pieces and then given to be meat, like food for the people inhabiting the wilderness... This is about God destroying this Leviathan and then that food just being provided for a whole multitude of people because of the massive size of this beast. And I'm just gonna, gonna quickly go over a few references of Leviathan because while Leviathan is or was a real creature, a real being, just like a serpent is a real creature, a real being that we could still see today, a snake, just as the snake is representative of Satan, so is Leviathan. And Leviathan, even much more so, I would say, has more uh, references to being associated with Satan, even more than the snake or the serpent, which, of course, also does. Uh, keep your place here, of course, in Psalm 74. And turn, if you would, to Psalm 104. Verse number 25. The Bible reads, So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping, innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. To play where? In the sea, where the ships are, right? That's what he was being referred to in Psalm 104. Again, this is the word of God. This isn't just the word of man. This isn't just a fairy tale or some storybook. This is the truth. Amen. It's talking about Leviathan in the sea and this is also why you know people want to scoff at that and make fun of the bible and and try to say that the bible's not true oh it's talking about these creatures and stuff well first of all you don't scoff at at the fact that there was dinosaurs and large creatures and large reptiles and other things that roamed the earth at some point whatever you want to say the history is of it that they existed right that's nothing to scoff at of course that was real so why is it so far-fetched to think that another type of a reptile or a lizard existed that was like a serpent or a dragon, especially when we have evidence from like every single old civilization, ancient civilization, that have pottery and paintings and all these other things that depict the same type of creature Amen. existing? Like, why? Because it was real. Everyone didn't all just conjure up and have the same image of some made-up creature in their mind. And it just so happens to be this great big coincidence that all these random civilizations all have the same thing. No, it's because the creature really existed. Turn, if you would, to Job 41. So right before the book of Psalms is the book of Job. And it's right near the end of the book of Job. We get this excellent description, really in-depth, of Leviathan. Just the, the most clear description because the entire chapter is dedicated to describing 
Leviathan. And you'll see all the characteristics and traits that are satanic, that, are, that, that associate the devil with Leviathan in this chapter. And there's a reason why I'm going so far in depth in this, because Psalm 74, I believe, is a prophecy of end times events that are still to come. And there's a reason why it's bringing up God's might, but then using Leviathan as being one of the illustrations to show God's might. The, this, this all ties together really nicely, so hang with me here. I know it's a Wednesday night, you might be a little tired, but hang with me if you can. Let's, we're gonna read through quickly through Psalm, four, or not Psalm, Job 41, and see these descriptions of Leviathan. It says, canst thou draw out Leviathan within hook? Again, illustrating it's in the sea, it's in the water, using a hook like you're fishing, right? Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words? Unto thee? And the answer to all these is no, right? It's the obvious answer. These are all just questions being put out there, not expecting a response because it's really clear what the answer already is. It's just God speaking these things like, what, you think you're going to pull Leviathan out with a little hook? You think that you can do that to this great beast? Because it's already known that he's this huge, massive beast. We're going to get into that more. It's just, so we keep reading this. Just keep that in mind. Verse 4, will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? And look, making a covenant with you, like, first of all, obviously the beast, you're not going to be able to make a covenant with a beast anyways. But this is also important with making a deal with the devil. Okay, don't forget that this is all still symbolic and representative of Satan. Wilt thou play with him as with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish spears? So, like, are you gonna are you gonna stuff this thing? Right? Like, can you you know, get the taxidermist and 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 fill him up with his, uh, his skin with barbed irons. You're not going to be able to do that. Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? This is talking about you know, someone just dying at the sight of him. Like what, just looking at him is enough for someone to be cast down. None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? So he's saying, like, like this creature is so fearful and mighty and, and people will die to look at. Well, who thinks they're going to stand against me, you know, against God, against the Lord? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. Talking about having scales. I mean, this is a dragon that you might picture in your mind having the scales, having the sharp teeth. He's saying who could pry open his mouth? The doors of his face. Verse 16, one is so near another that no air can come between them. So that the, the scales are like shields, like, you know, that, that is protecting his body. And they're so tight that there's not even air can fit between them. They're so close together. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered or, you know, parted, right? You can't be divided is what sundered means. Verse number 18, by his kneesings, a light doth shine and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. So he's got these orange red eyes. And it's talking about his kneesings is like this fire coming out of his mouth. Yes, a literal fire-breathing dragon is what Leviathan is. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. And, you know, people, again, they want to mock at this, but there's already creatures in creation that do things like this. I mean, look at, like, the bombardier beetle and things like that, like just amazing creatures that already exist today that you can look at. Why would this be so far-fetched to think that this could have been a real creature? Of course it was. 
Verse 20, out of his nostrils goeth smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. Talking about his heart being hardened so hardened it's like a millstone and what's a millstone used for grinding or, or you know like you're, you're using it as the hard surface against you do work right like that's how hard it is so it's it's meant to some, be something that's not going to be broken and that is the heart of satan or the heart of leviathan as it's being read here verse number 25, when he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. I mean, think about how easy it is to break straw or rotten wood. That's the way that, that the Leviathan looks at iron. It's just, it's nothing. It's nothing to him. Brass, it's like rotten wood. He just crushed right through it. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Again, another reference there showing us why he's used as uh, being symbolically representative of Satan. Right? What was Satan's biggest sin is his pride. Thinking more of himself and wanting to be like the Most High. He, did, he wasn't good enough to be this great, beautiful angel that was created with these great tabrets and these pipes. And he's a musical creature and he's a beautiful creature. And, and he was an angel of light, like Lucifer is a light bearer is where, where that name comes from. And, and so many great attributes of the angel that was created when God made him and he was good before sin was found in him, that wasn't good enough. He wanted to be like the Most High. And then that is the, that blinding pride that caused Satan to fall. And this creature of Leviathan is representative of that. Let's go. i got one more place. Turn if you go to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26, one more reference of Leviathan. And you'll see why I'm going into this now in just a second. But there's so much here about this creature. Now, now what a scary beast being, being uh, described there, right? I mean, it's saying like, like a guy is going to die just looking at this thing. And any type of weapon that you could imagine trying to bring against this thing, it's going to be like, it's nothing. It's, it's nonsense, right? It's going to scoff or laugh at someone trying to attack him with a spear or with a sword or you know, any of these things. But that's why I like in, in Psalm 74, when talking about the, the strength of the Lord, well, well, you know what? God was able to destroy him. It says, thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. And one other thing I also notice here, I guess I'll get to this in a minute, but notice it says, thou breakest the heads, plural, of Leviathan in pieces. Multiple heads. I think that Leviathan in general, the creature, has one head. Now, it's possible there were some that had more than one head, but... but this, again, is, is pointing to me as more of a symbolic reference of being the heads of Leviathan, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We'll, 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 sh we'll see that in Revelation, uh, why I think that that's the case here, which is also pointing to more of a symbolic reference than a, than a literal one, even though they're both present. 
the important meaning comes from the symbolic reference. Look at uh, Isaiah 26, verse number 20. So at the very end of the, of the passage there, just to get this in context, the Bible reads, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her. So the, the, at the very end of chapter 26, he's saying, he's calling his people, hey, enter into your chambers, shut your doors, and hide yourself just for a little bit until the indignation be passed. What? Why? Because God's going to bring judgment. So he's, he's talking about hiding the people of God and keeping them safe and protecting them because the Lord is, is coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Then chapter 27, verse number 1, the Bible reads, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And these references to hiding his people and bringing judgment upon the wicked and then killing Leviathan, I don't think this is just referring to, oh, hey, I'm going to kill this dragon for you. Right? Like, like there's this beast and he's kind of out of control, so I'm going to save you from this beast and then that's going to be it. Now, that physically happening is only a foreshadowing of the great dragon, of that great beast, of Satan ultimately being destroyed, which is an event that is still yet to happen in the future. Let's go back to Psalm 74. We're going to close out this chapter, and then I'm, I want to tie in some things together from Revelation. So this is going to be one of those points, of course, so keep this in mind as we finish up Psalm 74. Verse number 15, the Bible reads, Thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood. Thou driedst up mighty rivers. Still referring to the strength of God. Um, verse 16, the day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. I mean, all of these things is just controlling everything about his great creation, things that man could never control. The, the, the summer, the winter, the light, the sun, you know, all these things that are set in place are so massive. Hey, God's in charge of all of that stuff and can do whatever he wants with it. That's how much power that God has. Verse 18, remember this, that the enemy hath reproached O Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. So this psalmist is, is still calling to remembrance, God, what, what, these people have done these wicked things. They've been blaspheming you. They've been reproaching. Don't forget this, Lord. Don't let it go unpunished. Verse 19, O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. And this is the call for salvation. This is a call for saving of saying, don't, you know, don't forget us, God. The wicked are strong. They're mighty. They're, you know, they're out there. They're raging against us. Save us. Help us. Don't forget about us. The congregation of the poor, please don't forget about us. We need your help. Verse 20, have respect unto the covenant. God's covenant, the holy covenant, right? He's saying, have respect unto that. You know, don't forget us. You, you, you. You're our God, right? Don't leave us hanging here. And yeah, this let's let's finish off here before I get into before I get into Revelation six. For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Oh, let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproacheth thee daily. Forget not the voice of thine enemies. The tumult of those that rise up against thee increaseth continually. In the broad context of Psalm 74, we see this plea from one man of God who's, who's expressing the disastrous situation that the people of God are in. 
that they're in a really bad situation. And he's saying, don't forget us. Lord, where are you? We don't know how long. How long is this going to go? Things are really bad. God, we need you to save us. Right? He brings up his great power and his might. And he's also bringing up, look, these people, these wicked people need to be judged. God, don't let this happen. And this, the, the, the first thought when I was studying this chapter, the first thing that popped in my mind of all these various things is Revelation chapter 6. And flip over, if you would, to Revelation chapter 6. Because one of the questions in this passage was, how long? Oh, Lord, how long? When are you going to come for us, God? When are you going to save us, God? When are you going to judge these people, God? How long? We have the same plea in Revelation chapter 6. Of course, Revelation chapter 6 is the opening of the six seals where we start to see the great tribulation or the tribulation beginning with the four horsemen. And, and we, you know, we went through all of that earlier this year going through all of this chapter and this passage, but I want to focus on the fifth seal because this seems to be the place that Psalm 74 most aptly associates with when it comes to pr prophetic events of the future. Look at verse number nine. The Bible says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So we have this this these events that are going to happen in the future. We know that the Antichrist is going to come into power. We know that there's going to be an abomination of desolation that's going to be set up. We know that the people of God are going to need to, to flee. What, you know, there's going to, they're going to face a great tribulation such as was not from the beginning of the world nor, nor, nor ever shall be. We know that the Antichrist is going to make war against the saints and he's going to prevail. We know that there's going to be all of these bad events happening to the point to where a lot of people, a lot of children of God are probably going, God, where are you? Like, save us, God. We need your help. All these wicked people are blaspheming your name. All these wicked people are, are worshiping the Antichrist and the beast that was set up, and, and they're worshiping all this stuff, and they're just blaspheming the name of the Lord and the things of God. God, are you hearing them? What's going on? We're being, you know, sought after and destroyed and persecuted. Where are you? God, please help us. Save us. We know that you're strong. We know that you're mighty. God, Un, you know, take your right arm out of your bosom and, and destroy this wicked people. This is what's being described in Psalm 74, and this is going to be the state of things in the future. This is yet to come. These events similar to this, I believe, have already happened, but not to the same magnitude, not to the same just utter destruction and just an attempt to destroy every single saved person on this planet. That is going to happen when the Antichrist comes into power. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 13. Remember, I, I mentioned the heads, plural, of Leviathan from Psalm 74. And this all just makes sense that we have these things being brought up. We have, uh, you know, the enemy just coming in and destroying the sanctuary and doing whatever they will. Uh, that, that happened, and, it's, and I believe it's going to happen again, where the things of God are just going to be totally set at naught. And that's when they're going to set up this, uh, the abomination of desolation, as I already mentioned. And then we know that God is mighty to destroy Satan, and he talks about this physical defeat of the heads of Leviathan and pieces, gave us them to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. But when we see this great beast, or beasts, plural, really described in Revelation chapter 13, these beasts have more than one head. Look at verse number one of Revelation 13. The Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. 
And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So this beast is being referred to as a person, but then also being described as this great beast with seven heads and ten horns. God is able to destroy this beast, just like God is able to destroy the heads of Leviathan. But as I mentioned, I think the reason why it says the heads, plural, of Leviathan is a, is a foreshadowing of references to the beast that's being taught here in Revelation chapter 13 of these events to come, of these end times uh, events where it says here also, uh, verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And there's the reference, of course, to making war with the saints, as I've already mentioned, but specifically in this passage right here, the same passage that talks about this great beast with multiple heads and that great uh, uh, serpent. Or uh, uh, for, Sorry, how did they, how was the, uh, the, the dragon, excuse me, the dragon? And Leviathan is a dragon. And the dragon is being referenced in this passage. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, to overcome them. Power is given unto them over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That verse that we already referenced earlier in this passage. So as I look at Psalm 74, I think it's amazing. And you know, we, we know that all the books of the Bible, one, first and foremost, will reference Jesus Christ, but they also have prophecy in them. Amen. Just, I mean, you, it's amazing how much when you actually look at them. I don't know how many times I've read Psalm 74 in general, but now that I'm preaching through this and spending more time in study, it's amazing how much this is just extremely prophetic. Now, some of you may have already noticed that before, made note of it, great. But, but I didn't really realize how deep this was on prophetic events until studying for this. And it just kind of blows me away how much similarity there is. Just, it, it's just so evident that, that this is Psalm is referring to these events and, and how this was prophesied all the way, however long, you know, in the book of Psalms, during around the time of David. Like, it's amazing. God's word is amazing. Let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your amazing words. We thank you for prophesying of future events and, and, and just the fact that we know that your word is true and, and that these things all will come to pass just exactly as you've stated, dear Lord. Give us the wisdom that we need. Help us to understand your words, especially the prophecies and events that have yet to occur, that we can be ready, that we can be prepared, that we can be watching, that we can be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, dear Lord. Help us to understand these things. Help us to prepare others. Help us to reach the lost and get them saved before this time, dear Lord, so that they would never take the mark of the beast. And God, please just use our church and use other churches like us. Help us to, to grow and increase and, and to push back against all the wickedness and this darkness in this world, dear Lord. And Lord, just strengthen us, embolden us, and, and help us to just do everything that it is that you would have for us to do in this life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.